So, Graham was born 1894. Um, I, I first met her in 1958. I was 16. She was 64. And meeting her changed my life. I uh, came to do pre-med. I went to Tufts University for a pre-med uh, degree. And one of the dancers, uh, Robert Cohan, actually taught half-time in Boston at the New England Conservatory and half-time uh, in New York with Martha Graham. So while I was taking classes at Tufts, every free minute I had, I was in the studio because my parents didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and um, uh, so I graduated and I um, joined the Martha Graham apprentice group. I was given a full scholarship, which meant I could take as many classes as I could stand. I took six classes a day. <laughs> so shortly after uh, I moved to New York after my graduation, one day Martha called me into her studio. That was a big thing. Um, she didn't say anything, and then suddenly she looked at me. She said, what do you want? <laughs> I want to dance for you forever and ever, my whole life. And um, my heart was beating, you know, I'm going to be taken into the Martha Graham Dance Company. And she was quiet, and I said, oh, oh. And she turned to look at me and she said, you know, I have lots of people who can dance for me. And I was crestfallen. But she said, you know, you must listen to the footsteps of your own ancestors. What does she mean? I said, what, you know? And she says, so, in addition to taking classes, I want you to study with Louis Horst. So earlier I mentioned that Louis, in fact, some of the music was composed by Louis. Louis Horst was her music director. And many of Martha's earliest works, uh, he was the outside eye that helped her choreograph. And Martha said, you know, in addition to taking all the classes, you take all the classes with Louis, and you are a full scholarship student, which meant I didn't have to pay anything. And I also was doing extra work in the office to help out. The first assignment from Louis Horst was two bars of music uh, and allemand, and I'm supposed to do a composition based on that. So I went home and cried. I didn't know what from there that I was going to listen to my footsteps. So um, that was a tall order. I felt rejected by her, but at the same time, I, I knew she didn't say that to anyone and everyone. So I want to then share with you how I took her admonition and went to search for my ancestors' footsteps. So here is a um, barbershop pole. You know we have one in Rossmoor Parkway there. Sometimes they turn it on and it spins. So there are three strands. One is blue. Um, that is world events, 9-11. Uh, Japanese invasion of China. It's beyond our control, it happens. One is white, the lineage that you're born with, your parents, your grandparents. And then the other one is red. That represents the people who help you, who come into your life, who in Chinese we call guiren, the people who influence you. So when all three spins, you see it moves, but they can also stop. It can also be like DNA, um, outside influences, great, bigger than life, 
your own lineage, and then all the people who come into your life to help you. Southwest China, at the border of Myanmar, uh, Tibet, um, Indochina, and there the indigenous people dance and sing, and in every ritual, at every occasion of celebration, of birth, of wedding, of harvest. And I know when I was in my mother's womb, I was listening to this kind of singing and dancing. So um, I just want to share a few clips of these kind of indigenous uh, performers. People, actually, they don't do it as an entertainment, they do it for themselves. As you can see, people dance uh, at every occasion. It is part of everyday life. And I know that this kind of dancing is sacred. It is not false and it's life-giving. So the first strand of looking for my ancestors' footsteps will have to come to Yunnan, these indig indigenous people. The second strand is Chinese opera, or Jingju. And here are the two key figures in 20th century Chinese theater, uh, Mi Lanfang and Meng Xiaodong. Um, some of you might have seen uh, my favorite concubine. I think they show, we've shown it here at Rossmore. So um, I was fortunate to meet both of them. Um, in 1949, when the communists uh, took over China, many of the artists left China to Hong Kong. My uncle was in uh, a theater uh, patron, and he would have parties, and these extraordinary performers would uh, perform from their repertory. So the female Meng Xiaodong um, plays male role. It, it is, has nothing to do with transgender. It really has to do with the uh, your vocal range. Um, I didn't know that. One night, everybody was so excited um, and said, Meng Xiaodong's going to perform. And I crawled between the legs and I got a good seat. Um, she's a very, she was a very elegant lady. Her, her Chinese dress is always some kind of silk velvet. Her jewelry is first rate. You know, the diamonds just, just are subdued but beautiful. And as with the custom, there will be a musical interlude with the Erhu. And then her back is to the audience, and then she would turn and face the audience, and suddenly out of her mouth came this deep male voice. I, I was so stunned. I thought, how could this be? She was a woman, and then now she's a man. And at that point, I realized the power of theater. You can transform from one person to the other and make the audience believe you. Um, Mei Lanfang, who's male, actually sing female roles. Again, it is because of the range of his vocal, the vocal technique and also his training. So you can see on the left side, does she look female? Does she look female? Would you say she's female? Okay, and the one on the right, would you say he's male? Well, surprise, the one on the left succeeded his father and is actually male. The one on the left, uh, his sister took on male roles. So is that confusing? Not confusing if you understand the tradition. Mian Fong toured um, France in 1957. 
I was privileged to watch him and these two young children of his. Uh, they were in their teens. Um, they would rehearse every morning, and I would hide behind the post and watch. One day, he motioned to me and said, hey, little girl, Xiao she said, he said, you can come out and watch us. You know, you don't have to hide. And so I saw all three of them uh, practice, and that, again, transformed and changed my whole outlook about the power of theater. So some years later, the brother and sister, Mei Baojiu and Mei Baoyue, came to um, Los Angeles to recapture the 50th anniversary of their father's tour to the US, at which time, uh, during the tour, uh, Mr. Mei Lan Fong was given a doctorate by USC, and they came to redo this tour. I was on the faculty of USC, and, it, and I became the official translator and, and uh, uh, stayed with them for the wonderful two weeks that they were in LA. So you can see the um, likely likeness of uh, Mei Baojiu to his father. And this is a book about their father, uh, inscribed by the brother and sister. So I was, so come back to 1956, I became very interested in Chinese theater and asked my uh, uncle whether I could, you know, take some classes. He said, well, you're too old. <laughs> At 14, you're too old because people start at eight. But he said, you know, maybe we can get Mei Lan Fang's accompanist to teach you a segment from a very famous um, opera, The Emperor's Farewell to His Consort, The Sword Dance. It's like teaching me the dance from Carmen, you know. But there's another strand, and that strand is ballet. Um, this was in Hong Kong. We had the Royal Academy of Dancing, and it was very fashionable to speak English and also to take ballet. But we call it toe dancing or tippy point dancing. And here I am um, at 10, um, taking the Royal Academy of Dance syllabus grade two. I also um, took part in different performances like um, La Boutique Fantasque, the Cossack dance, um, and then also Russian Peasant Girl um, with my colleague who is doing a tarantella from Italy. In the middle is our teacher, Joan Campbell, who came from the Royal Academy of Dancing. And in addition to the syllabus that we learn every year in order to take the exam, she started to teach us little bits of repertoire, like the dance of the little swans. And we were absolutely beside ourselves to learn a real ballet from a real ballet piece. But one day she suddenly stopped in the middle of our rehearsal in the classroom and she said, you know, um, this is okay to do in the classroom, but you will not be doing this on stage. We can't have a yellow face in the middle. I was devastated. But fortunately, Isadora Duncan came to the rescue. Isadora Duncan, who took off her shoes, took off her corset, and liberated dance, and danced to the symphonies of Beethoven. And after Isadora came Ruth and Dennis. Um, so Ruth and Dennis was in uh, the West Coast in California and LA, and Martha Graham studied with her and performed with her. And Ruth actually, the Dennis Shaw Company, was the dance that preceded the silent movies. So they always did some vaudeville act. And one of them will be some Orientalia dance. This one is Japanese. 
1925, the Danishong Company went on a tour to Japan, China, and India. And this footage was taken in China. And um, we, I don't have the exact uh, record of it, but I know it has to be taped, the film in Tibet, in which many of the Tibetan monks were performing a ceremony. After Ruth St. Dennis came back, she and Martha Graham both choreographed something in response to their trip to Asia. Um, Ruth's work was called The White Porcelain, and Martha's work was called The Porcelain Lady. You can already see in these two photographs the depth of Graham's understanding of human movement and specifically of Asian dancers. Look at the uh, counter tension in the arm, the curve in the body, the use of the head. Whereas if you look at Ruth and Dennis, it's pretty much on one plane. Martha spoke an entirely different language, protesting, stark, and American. <laughs> Ugly, huh? Stark, but it really got over this whole thing of the one against the group. And this, you know, for a long time, she almost uh, used no music. It's just her own energy manifesting. Um, we, at the Valley Club, we already show Appalachian Spring, I think, a month or so ago. So this is really about Appalachia. I mean, Martha Graham was 14 generation Miles Standish, and the music was one of the Shakers' hymn. So I realized I can't, this is not my ancestor, right? But who is, who will be my ancestor? Would that be Confucius somewhere or uh, Beijing theater? How do I go about searching for that? Especially I'm in California, <laughs> Walnut Creek. <laughs> so when I left Martha Graham, in fact, she asked me to go search. I think she liberated me from foot binding, toe shoes, no need to, to uh, uh, suffer from that uh, horrific uh, point shoes, um, dancing little swans or big swans, um, imitating her and replicating her mold. And then she gave me the greatest present for any artist, and that is to search and listen to the footsteps of my own ancestors. Here I am in 1966 in Taiwan. Uh, on my right, some of you know him, uh, Yu Da Gang. He was a Renaissance man, um, erudite, steeped in Chinese classics, totally knowledgeable about European American arts literature, and he loved being with young people. But the best thing is, his brother was the Minister of Defense, which meant in the days of total curfew and red scare, we young people could stay out past nine. <laughs> we could drink coffee in coffee shops because she would, he would take us around. Um, I did not plan to be in Taiwan. I was headed for Hong Kong. But because of the Cultural Revolution, my visa kept not coming up. So my uncle lived in Taiwan, so he said, well, why don't you just start at that time with my family? Uh, my husband was on a uh, research project. He said, do it in Taiwan. And so we stayed. And Mr. Yu, the first thing he asked me to do was to give a talk about what the heck is modern dance. So in Chinese, modern, translated to modern, which is very trendy. 
but certainly Martha is not trendy. And so I had to delineate that the word modern should really be translated as contemporary. And I gave a lecture at the premier institution, the Jesuit University, very prestigious, and about 600 people came and 300 people were milling outside, couldn't get in. Uh, at this talk, uh, one of the most illustrious uh, con dancers and dance teacher of, of Chinese folk dance, uh, Mr. Lee Kamen came. And at the end of my talk, he stood up and he posed a question to me. He said, so Professor Wong, are you advocating that we give up our own Saoxing wine and drink whiskey? And I uh, was stunned. <laughs> um, what to do, what to do? And I said, well, Professor Lee, you are wearing a Chinese gentleman's uh, top, but the Minister of Culture who sponsored this talk is wearing a Western suit. Don't you agree that a Western suit and a Chinese top can coexist? So the next morning, the newspapers being censored have nothing better to print, so they put it in the front page. We can drink both whiskey and Saoxing wine. <laughs> so I think I won the history of uh, the battle of the, of the, what alcohol to drink. <laughs> then, um, Mr. Yu suggested that I begin to choreograph and give a concert. Uh, and when he suggested that to me, I said, how can I do that? We have no trained dancers. He said, well, you have bodies. They have bodies, don't, don't they? And I said, oh, I can't do that. You know, I'm, I'm steeped in the grand tradition. And he said, what are you waiting for? The perfect opportunity? You, if you don't grasp it, the opportunity won't come. And I remember what Graham said. So I had a good cry after Graham told me to go look for my ancestors. I had a second good cry after I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so my piece was an attempt to take a folk legend, the legend of the white snake. The story is a snake spirit turned into a woman when she fell in love with a scholar. And the abbot tried to separate them because he felt that there's something treacherous about her. <laughs> so we start this whole thing with at the back when the abbot was trying to separate the two lovers. So fortunately for me, the person who played the abbot was trained in Jinji as a martial arts specialist. So he was able to really whack it to us while we we're trying to stay together. And um, so she, this part, the woman is transfer, transforming from a snake into a human form. And she is using the excuse of borrowing an umbrella, which in this case, it just used the symbolic white cloth. And these are little snakes that follow me. And uh, here is the scholar who is finally came back to his senses and said, oh, I, I really like this snake lady, and is showing off how, how strong and a good candidate for husband he is. I also did other pieces, um, small vignettes uh, between man and man about human connection. This one is about the mechanization of city life. Uh, I used a uh, very well-known folk song that everybody hums in the streets. So every topic I use happened to reflect contemporary Chinese life, even though I don't specifically make us do Chinese-ness per se. Um, this could be from any, uh, it could be from Mars, but it does show the impact of industrialization on us. Um, talk about new love, you know, a boy and a girl. 
And then uh, a piece about evolution. And I, um, uh, the concert was very successful, and I got this wonderful award proclaiming me the artist of the, I don't know, year or century or forever. <laughs> but it was, it was worth something. Um, and I carted it home from the Minister of uh, Cultural Affairs. But I felt that I, I could not just stay in Taiwan in Nixon's ping pong diplomacy. Um, I got an invitation from the People's Republic of China. And I felt that part of my search for my ancestors' footsteps, I have to go back to China. And I was received at the National Institute for the Minorities. So those you know, are my people, because remember those people in Kunming who were dancing and singing. Unfortunately, they were all in a classroom, and a lot of their dancing have become a kind of mosaic from the Soviet Union. And although I went back to China many times through 1974 until 1990, bringing um, as a consultant to the Minister of Arts Education for new curriculum, uh, new arts education, uh, the use of technology. Um, here is in the Beijing School of Dance, and these students, bless them, have been touching the floor for the first time. And remember, before Graham took to the floor, it's so anathema for a dancer to be groveling around on the floor, and yet it is one of the most expressive dimensions available to a choreographer. But they, they took it in no time. Their, um, some of you have seen their touring companies. They're amazing now. I did not find my ancestors' footsteps in China. Not that they're not there, but I didn't know how to record it. I didn't know how to take the material and analyze it in a scientific way. So what came to my rescue was the work of Rudolf von Laban, who um, developed a system of looking at movement first by how to record it and notate it. Remember, music had scores for hundreds of years. Uh, painting, you don't have to be present to see it. You can go to a museum anytime and see it you know, from 14th century, from 11th century, from 9th century. But dance, like Graham's performance, is of the moment. When the moment is over, how are you going to, if you were to exit now and say, oh, I saw this really bizarre woman do that thing, how, what are you going to say? She's strange, she's beautiful, she's lyrical. We don't have a notation. So Lava uh, developed this, and I felt that I found something, finally, that I can trace this footstep without being romantic and without being copy, imitative. And you will know next week when you see, when you come to see Pina Bausch, Pina Bausch's legacy is also from the German school, from Lavan school. Fred Wiegmann believed that expressionist dance and classical dance were incompatible. Wiegmann had settled in Dresden and formed a school and company of her own. She continued to make use of space as Laban had taught her to, adding to that concept the mystique of her instinct and a more dramatic use of gesture.
in addition to uh, studying movement in a scientific way, I also renewed my study of martial arts. I wrote my master's thesis on the use of Tai Chi in, act, in actor training. And I went back to Tai Chi and to the specific uh, form of um, a trend called Ba Gua Zhang. And it was there that I finally understood what Graham's contraction and her technique was about. She talked about contraction and release. If you see Graham dance, she does not take a step because the music says take a step. She's, she would take a step as if the earth is moving and she is compelled to move. And I realized that all of us who, who study really misunderstood. We did contraction and then we did release. But instead, it really is the interaction of yin and yang. So it really is contraction until it it is totally into nothing, and then it becomes young. And the young grows and grows, expands, and then contracts again. And so it is a phenomenal life force that is pulsing and not an arbitrary throwing away. And it I owe a great deal to Master Adam Shu, teacher of the students at um, Cloud Gate. Many of you know Cloud Gate Dance Company, uh, Yunmen. And so for whole generations of Chinese dancers now, they're coming into the gem of Chinese training. That technique for me is the first step towards my ancestor, of knowing my ancestor's footsteps. I also use Lava movement analysis to look at, uh, this is from Manipuri, which is in the most northeastern part of India, it, it, uh, because I could not go into the area of Yunnan. I, this Manipuri is very, very close to the folks of Yunnan. I was able to film this and then uh, Kodak gave me four cameras so to understand how they move and then use it later for my choreography. Um, I was also fortunate in 1976, the Gandhi dancers, these are the people who repair the railroads. We no longer laid new tracks, but the tracks need to be maintained. And the Gandhi dancers, uh, they do call and response, and eight of them would line up and they would tap. And this is the basis of what I use for Golden Mountain, the stories of the, of the Chinese in America, how the Chinese railroad workers laid, and this is accurate, and um, I didn't make that up, this is how they work. So I knew I want to create this work about the Chinese in America and I could not find a place. I uh, was invited to join the faculty at UC San Diego in La Jolla. And the first thing I did was to go to the Salk Institute. So it was um, designed and built by the architect Louis Kahn. And I I went to see the only person that was open to the public, and that was the Vice President for Public Affairs. And I said, you know, I'm a professor at UCSD. I would like to use the Salk Institute Plaza to create this work about the Chinese and American. He said, no, 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 no. No performance. We don't want that noise. So I said, thank you. I walked out. I turned the corner, and there was Dr. Salk's office. I walked in there talked to the secretary, and she said, oh, I'll go and see if Dr. Salk can see you. So I went in, I told Dr. Jonas Salk what I had in mind. And he said, but of course, 
I always wanted Picasso to work at the Salk Institute. And he, he leaned over, turned on the intercom, told his secretary, um, please, please um, let, I think, Mr. Peterson know that I said yes to Professor Wong. So I got um, permission to do my work at the Salk Institute. Um, next to Salk is his wife, Francoise Gillot, who is best known for, for uh, scandalously, for um, being the mother of Paloma Picasso, and uh, a phenomenal artist, scientist in her own right. And many of you know this photo of Francoise and Picasso. So I just want to show you a little bit of the images from Golden Mountain. This is looking, the, the figure on the floor ground is looking into the Pacific. Um, the concrete on the ground um, um, is a specific, specially mixed concrete with ashes and inert materials. Louis Kahn, the architect, named this between silence and light. And he talks about the spirit in this place. And when I saw it, I said, this is the right place to tell the heroic story of the Chinese in America. Um, these are the real, real workers. I don't have thousands, I don't need thousands. I just have five men and they are the backbone of the Trans-Pacific um, Railroad. Okay, um, I want to also share Francoise Gillot, who herself is a phenomenal artist, poet, writer. Um, so after I did my work, Golden Mountain, at the Salk Institute, she and I collaborated, and she designed the costumes, the masks, and the scenographic element for my next work, which is called Shime. So Francoise, uh, we were working on the costume and she had a few words to say about my artistry. For me, the, the I'm impressed by the continuous, but the continuous that transform itself all the time, meaning continuous but not repetitive. That's a different thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I would say struck me. Because there are some dancers who are, it's not because you are a dancer, because you say, well, in, in that case, all dancers are continuous, because in dance, you have one movement after the other. But that doesn't create continuity in my, in my mm -hmm. uh, mind. You have a lot of motion. Yes, motion exactly. It does doesn't create. create. So the fact that one motion flows naturally into the other, that's what I call continuity. And that, in, in fact, I think that's what allows not only the dancer to move, but the space to dance. Mm -hmm. So that when I can see in a choreography that not only dancers are moving, but the space is piling around mm -hmm. them, then I can think this is a dance. Okay, so this is some of the, uh, this was at the Noguchi Plaza. Again, Francoise did the costumes. She did the mask for me. This was in Australia, Between Silence and Light, from the Sydney Opera House. Outside, um, also in Sydney, the same work, three nights, three different events. Um, cast of 400 people uh, dancing and playing instruments and celebrating. Um, the Aborigines also taught all the people, audience and uh, performers alike, the dances that they have found. They don't call it choreograph, they call it the dances come to them like a spirit. And this is a work I did in Seattle about Hiroshima and uh, by the waterfront. Um, and this is Golden Mountain. I didn't have six cameras. I had one camera to film this. I was on the faculty of UCSD. I have a key to the 
to the camera. I took the camera and we burned a hole in it the first day because my technician aimed it at the sun. <laughs> so that was the story. Um, we did the best we could. Uh, the two things I learned about choreographing and recording. To re those of you who like Roy, who is a, a filmmaker, first of all, you cannot just record because as you can see, the screen is rectangle, but the human figure is vertical. So you have to re-choreograph for the camera. And you saw the World Cup. How many cameras do you think there were? At least 25. And you intercut. I had one camera. Um, we had lost some footages. So this is Golden Mountain reconstructed. Um, the young man who filmed this went on to work with um, the Muppets. And he uh, became part of uh, Jim Henson's um, inner circle. But he came back 20 years later to re-edit it for me. So it is not a... Um, um, it is what it is, a reconstruction, and I hope you enjoy it.